together right and you never know what's gonna happen we, we we try our best to get the songs to go with the sermon but I feel like they're more for me I couldn't go to church yesterday. I just couldn't. I lost my mother on Friday. I was supposed to have rehearsal that same night. I just couldn't do it. Ah, oh, thank God I, I guess um, things worked out to where I didn't have to sing. And even with today, I mean, I wasn't here. <laughs> At the time, I should have been here, so I'm sorry for being late. But we get the service back, and I'm like, oh, the songs for this week that we had suggested were the best, perfect for this week. That was last week when I gave those songs, or when those songs were given. I had no clue that the songs that were taken out and these songs that were putting in, put in, mercy, I can't speak, bear with me. They would be for me. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. And when that rain came, and when that wind blew, my house, everything I believe in, everything I live by was built on you. So I can come and say hallelujah. I can come and say praise God. I can come and sing with the gift that God gave me. I'm, I'm, I said we're, we're done with it, but I want to do it one more time. I want to do it one more time. Is that all right? Will you bear with me? Is that all right? Come on, join me with it. Rain came.
my distinct pleasure to introduce Pastor Brian Petrie, Associate Pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in New York. Pastor Brian was born and raised in Clarksburg, West Virginia. While attending college at the Virginia Military Institute, he came to a place of desperation in his life that led him to read the Bible. He soon placed his faith in Jesus as his personal savior and his life was supernaturally changed. Pastor Brian received his master's degree in public policy at Regent University and in 1996, he moved his young family to New York City where he began serving at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. Within a few years, God called Pastor Brian into full-time ministry at the church. After directing the young adult ministry for three years, he was ordained as an associate pastor, directing the marriage ministry and serving as an interim pastor at one of the Brooklyn Tabernacle's daughter churches, Manhattan Grace Tabernacle in Harlem, New York. He presently serves in various administrative and leadership capacities at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, assisting and directing various organizations and operational ministries of the church. He's married to Susan and has four children, Luke, Claire, Levi, and Charlotte. He's also thoroughly enjoying his first grandson, born in December of 2023. Today, Pastor Brian will minister God's word to us right after the next song. <laughs> so I'm an interjection, I admit. But before he comes, please join me in giving a warm Grace Point Bermuda welcome to Pastor Brian Petrie. We're so thankful that you're here with us.
good today? I hope you are. No matter what you go through, I, uh, I just want to say to my friend Jaden over here, my brother, that was an encouragement to me. Just saying, there's a lot of places you could be this morning. You could be curled up in a fetal position in a bed, and understandably so. Um, that's an overwhelming thing to have to, to go through, right? Mother, grandfather. But there's a, I think there's an object lesson there for all of us to take away. Maybe you'll forget what I preached about today, but as Jaden stood here today, and despite the challenges that he's facing, he was saying, not by, not by sight, right? We don't live by what we feel. We live by the one who is, Jesus. Jesus has the ability to ground us no matter what the challenges in life might be. And so my brother had grace this morning to lead us into worshiping God. But that was a choice this morning. That's a choice. It's something I'll come back to later. It's a choice that we have to be mindful of every day as a choice to either lean into Jesus or try to figure it out on our own. And whatever the challenges are, when you lean into him, you find grace, right? I, I sense grace coming off his life as, he, life as he's leading us this morning. And so it's supposed to be with all of us as we go through the challenges of whatever the day might be. Jesus is with us. And when we lean into him, he gives us the comfort. He gives us the strength that we need to not just make it, but to, to continue to not just endure, but to overcome. Right? So continue to pray for our brother. Jane, Jane, we're going to be praying for you in Brooklyn, my friend. Because today is one day, but it's one day at a time. One foot in front of the next. You had to wake up this morning and lean into Jesus. Lean into him today. Lean into him tonight. Lean into him tomorrow. But don't forget as a congregation, it's one thing to come here, sing a song, raise your hands, give somebody some love when they're here. Follow up this week. Help him to know he's got family that love, care for him, and they're supporting him. Amen? Amen. It's supposed to be a family here. It might look a little different, might come from different biological families, but it's the family of God. So, my brother, thank you for that. You encouraged me. Um, it's been a while since I've been to Bermuda. I'm so happy to be back. I, uh, it's a good thing to get out of New York, earthquakes. and Somebody said yesterday it was overcast. It wasn't a good day. I said, look at my face. I caught some sun. I couldn't catch that in New York. Yeah, so I'm really grateful to be back. I love Pastor Gary, love this congregation. We've prayed for you all over the years, continue to pray for you as we go forward. But it's good to be with family. It's good to be around people that love Jesus. There's a lot of things I enjoy to do in life, but there's nothing I enjoy more than being with people that look to him, love him, and just depend on him for what they, for what they have before him. So I want to take a few minutes to encourage you. Uh, I have to repent for living hope. Um, Gary called me and he said, so I, I got to go into church tomorrow. What's the title of the message? I'm like, bro, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying tomorrow <laughs> in Brooklyn, not what I'm going to say next week in, in Bermuda. So he's like, well, give me something to go with. I'm like, well, we always have living hope. So <laughs> Jesus gives us living hope. I'm sure that'll apply in some way. It's going to apply in some way. But as I prayed through the week, I, uh, I kept coming back to this, this issue of anger. I don't know who this is for here today. But uh, I, I felt like I was supposed to encourage us with, what do you do with anger? Like, is, is, it, is it okay as a Christian to be angry? And if it is, what do you do with it when you are faced with circumstances that can make you angry in life? Any of you ever get angry about anything? I mean, you live in a great place. There's not to be much to be angry about here. Maybe apart from the prices. I had dinner last night, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is more expensive than New York. Welcome to Bermuda. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot in life to be angry with. Even though it's been a, a, a few years since we've been together, so much has changed. So much has changed in New York. I'm sure a lot's changed in here in, Brook, in, in Bermuda. Um, but when you think about just all the challenges that we face, I was reminded as I was just thinking of this message, like, is it okay to be angry? Yeah, Second Timothy, in the third chapter, talks about what it's going to be like as we move toward the last days. Move toward the last days, things are going to get dark. How many of you would agree, even though you got some sunshine here in, Brooklyn, in, in Bermuda, it is dark? And if you don't think so, come visit me in Brooklyn, and I'll show you some, 
some stuff that you'll consider to be dark. But it says in the last days, people are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, lovers of things that will make them look inwardly instead of upwardly into others. How do I love myself over others? We're, we're going to, as we move toward the end, it, it's going to become something where we're so self-consumed that we destroy ourselves and we destroy the people that are around us in the process. That's why the last days will be so dark, it'll be devoid of love. And as you start to consider, well, what would make people that way? It says kids aren't going to, like, respect their parents. They're going to be angry at their parents. They're not going to honor them. Well, why wouldn't they? There's reasons for it. Um, when, you, when you think about just the challenge of what you may endure in your own family, what you endure in your, your community, what you see in the world playing out. Over the past few years, I, in Brooklyn, I've been like, there's not been many things that have been able to break up the life of our church in Brooklyn, when you pray and when you try to love Jesus, there's, there's power that comes with that that keeps people united. But, you know, over, over COVID, things got crazy. Like there was, there was medical division, people, are you going to wear a mask? You're not going to wear a mask. There was cultural uh, realities that played into it. Um, th there was a cultural thing that came into the life of our church that was like, are you serious? Like, I had friends that I'm, I've known you for, for 20 years. Like, I'm, I'm the godparents of your of, of your kids, and because of social media and because of things playing out in the world, the, the, the cultural realities, that's playing into the church? Like, you're looking at me suspect now? Really? Like, you're angry at me for what? I've only done anything but the best I can to try to love you, and you're going to be angry at me for what? The color of my skin? Really? Politics. Oh, my goodness. Talk about anger. Just mention... Depending on the circle, mention, like, mention Trump, mention Biden, and all of a sudden it's going to split a room up and there's going to be people like throwing things back and forth across the aisles. And I don't care about either one of them. Like, my hope is in Jesus. It's not in some politician. But, but it's amazing to see in the life of believers how just the mention of politics can stir people with such animosity. It's not cultural, if it's not political. You look in the Middle East, there's religious challenges that are making people hate one another. And people who don't even care about religions are taking sides. Like, with real venom. What is up with all of the anger in the world? It's real, isn't it? It's real. And you can come to church and people can have a smile. And they can, praise God, sister. Praise God, brother. Let me give you some love. And, and, and in their heart, they walked in here because their husband wasn't exactly what the husband should have been in the past several months, past several years, whatever. There's anger in the heart. Or maybe it's the wife. The wife's not respecting the husband. And so uh, the, the husband is angry because he doesn't feel loved, because he doesn't feel respected. Kids are sitting in here like, wait, you don't understand. You don't know who my mama is. My daddy is behind the door. Like, they come to church, they raise their hands, they talk about Jesus, but then they're really angry at home, and it makes me really angry. Neighbors, they don't respect the property line, whatever. <laughs> Bosses who take advantage, don't pay you enough, whatever. It, it can play out in so many different ways. And as Christians, like, we have to figure out, what do we do with it? You, you, you have loss, like Jaden just experienced. We weren't made for loss. When you lose somebody that's dear to you, it, it, can that provoke anger inside of you? You better believe it can. I've lost people. When people die, it's like, God, we weren't made for this. My heart wasn't made to deal with this kind of pain of separation. Why would you take somebody? It's real. Maybe it gets quiet because I'm asking you, as I'm mentioning all these different things, your own life, if God brought me all the way to Bermuda, which I'm glad he did, to try to encourage you. This isn't for the person next to you. This is for you. Anything in your heart you might be angry at. Well, you can just say, no, I'm not really angry. Angry sounds like not Christian. It's, it's like a little too intense. How about just annoyed? <laughs> Who are you annoyed with? And when you look at the person, here, here's how you know. Here's how you know whether this has got life to it. That person can rob you of peace. That person can rob you of joy. If that person can rob you of love. You might have an issue with them. And it's an issue that Jesus is saying, we've got to figure out how to deal with. 
Because you can't walk around life annoyed. You can't walk around life angry. You can't walk around life retreating. Because when you're angry, there's one of two things you do. You either square up or you back up. And either way is not really like the one that we say we're supposed to be following. Because it says this. It says this in 1 John in the second chapter, in the sixth verse, it says this. It says that you and I, if we claim to be in faith, must walk like him. Now it's going to get really quiet. <laughs> because you are supposed to be a living expression of Jesus. Well, no, you just, I, I got to get close to the mark. I'm not really Jesus. He's going, oh, yeah, I put my life inside of you. And if you get out of the way, that's the life that comes out. I actually come out when you do this right. And I, and I expect to come out. You know, the Spirit of God was given to you so that Jesus could be seen in you. It's his one mission in your life as he's come in to help you. It's his mission that he would draw out glory to the name of Jesus in the way that you think, in the meditations that you have over other people, in the way that you reach out, in the way that you engage them. He is with you. He is empowering you so that Jesus can be seen. That is his mission in your life. And so if you're claiming to be trusting him, you're claiming to be in relationship with him, you got to be walking like him. Did Jesus walk around angry? And some of you are going, yeah, well, he went and flipped over some tables. All right, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> he did. He flipped over some tables. And that, that speaks to the way that we express anger and, and the, the appropriate way of expressing anger. There's an appropriate way to do it. And that's what I want to take a second to try to get our hearts and our minds lined up. Can we all agree that we're supposed to be angry free, not angry free, but we're supposed to be people who know how to deal with anger in ways that bring about the glory of God in our life. Do you know that that's God's will for you today? If you don't, let's take a look at some scriptures so that we can convince ourselves of that. It doesn't matter what you think and feel. What matters is what God says. What he says is our, is our living hope. I just tied it into the sermon title. Yeah, well, at least I can say to Pastor Gary, I, uh, I didn't lie. I want to read this passage of scripture. It comes from Matthew. It comes from the fifth chapter, and it starts in verse... 21, it says this, and God, give us ears to hear. Help us, Lord, I don't want to just speak. I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word. Give us ears to hear, God. Give us faith to trust. It says this, Jesus, this is part of when he goes up, Sermon on the Mount. He gets everything, everybody together, and he says, you know, you heard a declaration of Ten Commandments from Moses. This is kind of the updated, more intense version of the Ten Commandments. In verse 21, he says this, and you've heard our ancestors were told, one of those commandments that Moses gave, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with somebody, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you're pressing, I'm sorry, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So again, context for this is Jesus is trying to help all these religious people understand that there's something more than the outward action, conforming life to some outward pattern. Like you can't kill somebody. You guys could sit in here and say, um, you ever heard of David Berkowitz? You know who David Berkowitz is? You've heard of Adolf Hitler. You've heard of Genghis Khan. You've heard of... These are people... David Berkowitz was a guy back in the late 70s that held New York at hostage point because he was murdering women just indiscriminately um, and brought a lot of fear. He actually became a Christian, an amazing testimony. Um, same can't be said maybe of Hitler, Genghis Khan, these people that slaughtered people in mass. You can say, I'm a good person. I don't murder anybody. That's what the Pharisees thought. The ones that Jesus was speaking to, they're like, okay, yeah, so we're not supposed to murder somebody. I, I'm a good person. I didn't murder anybody. And Jesus goes, okay, but hold on. Where does murder come from? It actually comes from the stuff that goes on inside. He actually gets this down into a more reduced version of sin in the heart. He says, if you even have 
an issue with somebody, like where you're calling them a name. You're, you're disrespecting the image of God in which they're made. You've lost sight of who they are in God to the point where you can curse them, where you can have anger and rage toward them. Well, if that happens, you can be sure you stand just as much in the way of judgment as somebody who's murdered someone. This is, this is like, this is intense. Because every one of you has sat and thought like, I, I've, you know how many people I've called names over the years? I, I, I don't say that with any pride, but I'm just saying. Driving on the BQE in Brooklyn, somebody cuts you off. You're like, you're an idiot. I just, I'm standing now on the, fire of the, line, the firing line of judgment, right? That's what Jesus just said. He, have you ever cursed somebody? I say this to my shame. I, I've, I've cursed my father. I never cursed my mother, but I cursed my father. Wished him dead. That's, that's terrible. I'm a bad guy, I know. But that's not the half of it. Because what goes on inside of me is so much worse than a few things that I might be willing to admit on a platform. And before you judge me, if you're older than me, you're worse off than me. <laughs> if you're younger than me, you haven't lived as long as me, so maybe I got something on you. But the truth is, there is all kinds of wickedness that's going on on the inside. And Jesus is saying that kind of wickedness, that kind of wickedness is going to bring you to a place of judgment. Judgment? Meaning what? Judgment, in this context, the fires of hell? Like, see, this is where church, can you just come down from New York and not tell us about the reality of a hell? Like, just give us a little, some warm fuzzy so we can walk out of here and feel good about ourselves. I want you to walk out of here, not to feel good about yourselves. I want you to walk out of here and feel good about a Savior. And so a Savior says, you got this kind of stuff going on inside of you. Trust me, there's judgment that's coming. But then that makes us pause and stop and say, well, hold on. If that kind of stuff going on inside of me could bring down judgment on me, then, like, what do I do with this? Let's just talk for a second about what anger is. It's an emotion, right? It's, it's, it's like a negative emotion. It's a negative emotion that we have as it relates to things that happen in life that we don't like. I'm just saying, if I'm Jaden right now, I'm going to be a little angry in a natural way because if I just lost my mother and my grandfather on the same day, I'm, I'm going to have some like or negative emotional responses to something that's happened. So... Jesus is saying you can't be angry, though. Well, how do I then not feel what I feel? That actually doesn't make sense. You're going to judge me for allowing things to play out in my life that anybody, everybody, is going to actually take exception to what they're going to feel negatively about to the point where it's going to make them want to react in a way that isn't so wholesome? Well, what do we do with this? So it's not so much that you have the negative reaction. It's what you do with it that matters. See, it says this, uh, flip over to Ephesians. In Ephesians, in the fourth chapter, it says this. It says, so stop telling, I don't know, uh, verse 26. And do not sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So now, here we are. Seems like almost biblically we're getting a pass now. It says, be angry and don't sin. Be angry and don't let sin control you. So be angry? I actually can be angry? But wait, it just said I could be judged for being angry. Well, let's just back a little further up. Can we just take a second and remind ourselves the image of the one in whom we're made? We're made in the image of God. Does God get angry at things? Some of you are like, absolutely. Absolutely. Some of you are like, I don't know. I don't want to. Show of hands, does God get angry? Okay, everybody. Some of you don't believe that God gets angry. Well, he does get angry. You know, the Bible, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is this. It comes out of Exodus 34th chapter in the sixth verse. It says that, you know, Yahweh, the Lord, he's, he's compassionate, he's gracious, he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. Doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. If you start looking at the way that he disciplined the people in Israel, the people in Judah, you can see that he gets angry. And if you read the prophets, there's a lot of anger that comes out of God's mouth toward people that would turn their heart away from him. And they had this stiff neck. They wouldn't, they wouldn't turn up. They would just continue to 
is maybe it relates to anger, like they would use it and they would turn it inward instead of looking upward. And, and God, whenever we look away from him and turn to ourselves instead of trusting him, it makes him angry. So let's just a little further step back. When God created, why, why does God get angry? When God created the world. When God created the universe, God created it with an order that was perfect, that everything worked in harmony with one another, that as you and I came and took our place in creation, we, and as we depended upon him, we walked out the way that we were made to walk out, a way that would bring blessing to us, bring, that would bring blessing to the people around us. It would help us to know his love. It would help us to make his love known. When we walked in his way, there was life, there was love, there was peace, there was harmony. Everything kind of flowed the way that it was supposed to. But what happened when we said, you know what? I don't have to listen to you. In fact, you gave me the option here to not listen to you. I don't think I want to listen to you. I think I want to do this my way. When we turned from him, what ended up happening? Everything in creation got thrown off. But the chaos that started inside of me now, because now there was the God who brought order by his presence into my soul, I'm now left to myself. I'm now left to do what is best for me. So anger is just me doing life on my terms to get what I think is best for me and using that emotion to try to manipulate people to control them. I'm going to explain that for a second. How many of you have ever been around somebody that gets really angry? Okay, so these two, they, they make each other angry. I'm just kidding. He, <laughs> he's like, he, he makes me angry. No, she makes me angry. Wait until you get married. <laughs> Been around somebody that's got a wicked temper. I, I had people in my family that had well, pretty wicked tempers. When somebody has a wicked temper and it comes out, what does it make you do? It makes you kind of back up. It makes you kind of go, okay, well, especially if you're younger and their people are older and they're stronger. It, it kind of makes you feel afraid to the point where you just go along with what they want you to do, right? That's why they get angry. Anger is about control. Anger is about manipulation. Anger is about getting things lined up so that it'll be what I want it to be. Now, God, when he looked at the beginning at a man who did their own thing and began to throw everything off and began to bring pain to his heart because he made us for this kind of love. He made us for this kind of order. And when we step out of it, it breaks his heart because he loves us. I have four kids. I have a grandson. Any pain that they bring upon themselves brings pain to my heart. But then it's more complicated than that because it's not just they're bringing pain to themselves by not lining themselves up with the, the, the way that they should do things. From God's perspective, when I step out and I don't trust him, it now brings pain upon everybody that's connected to me. Because sin, which kind of is the root of all anger, sin is just I'm going to do it my way to get what's best for me at your expense. And when somebody gets their way at my expense, what do you think happens to me? I get a little angry. You know, at the beginning, uh, Cain and Abel, the story, Cain is the first person that expresses anger on the other side of the fall. And he gets angry. Why? Because God doesn't bend to the way that he wants God to be worshipped. Cain has a particular way that he wants to worship God. And God says, no, the, the way has already been set. And you're not conforming to it. So now he gets mad at God and he starts taking it out on his brother because God isn't going along with the way that he wants it to be done. Wait, who's God? Cain or God? No, God is God. Cain is supposed to be lining himself up to the way that God has ordered things on the other side of a fall and he doesn't want to. So now he gets mad and now he starts to take it out on a brother. He actually puts his brother in the ground and kills him because of that kind of anger that he had that now got the best of him. See, when you don't allow God to help you with your anger, what does it do? Like Cain was warned by God, it's sin is crouching at your door. It's going to get the best of you. You better watch out. That thing that's stirring up on the inside of you, it's going to get you. And for Cain, it started to create jealousy. He, God loves him more than he loves me. God! And now, Abel. It's the way it works. And when God watches the way anger plays out, he's now sizing up fallen man and he's going, you guys are angry because you want it to be done your way. You want to act like you're God. You want everything to conform to the way that you want it to be done. That's why anger is such an ugly reality before God. 
Because when I demand it to be done my way and I start taking it out on other people, when I don't have it flow the way that I want it to flow, God is going, you're, you're, you're now making this so much worse. And now you're going to start provoking out of other people the same kind of ugliness. And before you know it, you've got a world that's fighting against itself. And when you read the headlines and all the news feeds, you have to admit, like, the chaos that's happening all over the world, the anger that people have one toward another, the anger that people have over political parties, the anger that people have over religion, the anger that people have over the abuse that happened in their home, the anger that husbands and wives have because they can't get along, the anger that kids have because they've been brought into a home that's full of a mess because parents can't figure out how to put Jesus in the rightful place. Like, where does all this anger come from? It comes from a good place for a good reason. Now, God watches all this play out, and he says, left to yourselves, you're going to live in anger and be separated, be forever. But God's own outlook on our lives, there's now anger that he has toward us because of what we do. And this is where you have to pay attention. We just came out of Easter. What's Easter about? Easter is about a God who is at war against man and made peace with him. Why would God be at war against man? Because God hates sin. And God is not going to allow sin to continue to command and dominate the reality of the way relationships play out in this world. And so God entered into time and space. God took on the form of a little baby and allowed himself to go through all the crazy things that you and I have to go through. All the things that create anger, Jesus was subject to. And yet Jesus didn't sin. Did Jesus have abusive realities in his community and his family? Probably, yeah. Doesn't say that, but I mean, you can just speculate. The people that he was born into, they were sinners just like everybody else. Was there a mess that he was born into beyond just the bigger world? Of course, there was a mess all around. And yet Jesus was subject to it. Why would he allow himself to be subject to that? Why would he allow himself to be subject to loss? It seems like Jesus' father ended up dying before the mom. Was that a real loss to him? Was that not somebody that he considered to be a father and his dad? Yeah. Did, did, when, when he passed, was there a sense of like, oh, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. I wish this were different. Of course there was. Is it okay to, to have a sense of anger in that way? It's okay to agree with God. God looks at sin, and he looks at the effects of sin on our world, and he has anger toward it. And he's saying to you, you and I have to, have the same opinion that he has. I can't disagree with the way that God sees it. When God watches a child be abused, does he have anger toward it? When God watches somebody lie to somebody else and create illusions that aren't really true, and that messes a person's uh, own way of processing out reality, does, does that make him upset? Of course it does. All sin creates and provokes out of God because of what it does. It provokes anger out of him. And so God is saying, you can agree with me on it, it's okay, but you can't let it command you. But Jesus came into the world so that it wouldn't command us. On Easter, we celebrate that he went to a cross. He went to a cross in part living perfectly, being tried and tested in every way so that anger wouldn't, and we're just talking about anger right now. We could talk about any sin, but so that anger wouldn't have command over man's heart. He lived perfectly through the trial of all kinds of temptation in that way so that on the cross he would be able with all of your anger to say if you'll put your hope in me I'll exchange my record of perfection in dealing with anger for your all the ways you've not dealt with it in the right way I'll take that upon myself and I'll give you my account of perfection in that way so now that begins to give us hope today because Jesus is saying if you got anger in your heart you're going to stand in light of judgment. And Jesus is going, but I came into the world so that that judgment would pass over you. I came into the world so that that anger wouldn't be something that would be held to your account. When it's negative, when it's, when it's about you and it's about your own sin, I came to be able to cleanse you from that. And on a cross, he took your sin, he took your judgment so that there would be a way for God now to come and make his home in your heart. 
know, the most amazing thing about Easter is that Jesus went to a cross. He died. He took judgment. He makes the exchange, per, imperfection for per, perfection. That's amazing. I, I'm so grateful for that. But the most crazy part to me of Easter is the resurrection, where sin and death are conquered. And on the other side of it, there's resurrection life. And that same power that took over the death of Christ in a, in a real tomb and brought life back to his body is the same power that now comes and lives in me and lives in you. And that power is not a power of, of like unrighteous anger. It's a power of love. It's a power that has the ability now to command us in a way where we're not held hostage to everything that everybody does to us. We don't have to live in some kind of anger toward what's happening in the world as some way of like, I'm angry, I got to retreat, I got to, you, do, do you understand what those Republicans are doing? Do you understand what those Democrats are doing? Do you understand what those white people are doing? Do you understand what those black people are doing? Like, I don't have to live in any kind of oppression by any of that reality because his love, his life is inside of me. I'm free of it because Jesus lived free of it and he gave me that same life and that same power within. One or two amens. This is good. This is good. This gives me hope today. Now, let's just recap for a second. So is it, is it okay for a Christian to get angry? It absolutely is. God gets angry at things. Maybe some terrible things have happened to you today. Stuff that you just tried to go, oh, I got a berry I can't think about. We were, we were talking about the sexual abuse when we were driving over in the car, uh, Sean and I. Just with the effect that it can have on people when that happens. Get angry about it? Oh, yeah, you get angry about it. But I don't want to think about it, so let me just, like, try to bury it. I was telling you before, like, with my dad, I really had some challenges, like, dealing with him. I, I, did, not, I did not like him. I, I, I did not love him. He didn't love me. And I knew it. I knew it from an early age. I had older brothers and sisters. I watched him love them. I'm like, why does he love them and not me? Well, I wasn't his kid. My mother had an affair, and so I was the result of the affair. I didn't know that until I was... Uh, 22 years old, but I grew up wondering, man, this dude hates me. I hate him. Like, I don't know why. I, I, I can't figure out why he doesn't like me, but I tell you what, I don't like him just because he doesn't like me. And then I became a Christian, and then I started reading a passage like this where I'm like, I, 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 I got to figure out what to do with this anger. I tried to bury it and act like it didn't exist. Ah, forget about it. I hate him, but just don't let me look at him. Just don't mention his name and I'll be fine. But if, you, if I saw him and if you mentioned his name, I would go from a big smile to like a full-on grimace in like a half a second. Well, how did I deal with that as a Christian? I actually had to acknowledge that I had a lot of anger. And I had to acknowledge why the anger was there. God, it wasn't right to have a dad that didn't love me. But... You knew something about this. Every kid is a gift from God, whether they come into the world in an illegitimate way or a legitimate way. Children are a gift of God. So you purpose this. Now, I don't know how to make sense of that. Like, I can't be angry because if I get angry, I could be, like, judged. But what do I do with it? Well, I have to figure out how to trust Jesus for it. Well, how do you do that? Be angry and don't sin. So I just gave you the backdrop of what Easter is because every one of you, if you put your hope in Jesus, you don't have to be controlled by your emotions and by your past. You actually have a new master that's inside of you. It's, it's Christ alive within you. He told the disciples, it's going to be better than I go because when I do, I'm not just going to be helping you from the outside in. I'm going to be in the inside out helping you. I'm going to do inwardly what you could never have done for you. I'm going to work with the way that you feel. I'm going to work with the way that you think. I'm going to work with the way that you put your thinking and feeling together to make choices that actually will bring blessing into your life, which will help you to grow in love and help you to grow in life. He's there for that purpose. But what do you do with that when you're confronted with something that is just not right? Bring it to him. That's all this passage is saying in Ephesians. Bring it to him. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Whatever is troubling you, bring it to him. It, it, it's a communion thing. Bring it to him. God, this is what I'm angry about. Don't try to deny it. You, nobody in here is super spiritual. Nobody is so spiritual that you don't have me, uh, feelings. Guys, I think, do a better job trying to compartmentalize their life and taking their emotions and kind of, okay, bury it than, than women do. Women are more fluid in their emotions. Women can talk about their emotions. Just ask a guy, like, what he thinks and feels, and he's like, oh. what do you think? 
You tell me. I'm married. I'll tell you. My wife will say, what do you feel? I go, I don't know. What do you feel? I'll feel what you feel. <laughs> because guys just don't like to talk about what those realities are. But God is saying, no, I made you in my image. Those are good things. Emotions are good things. Anger is actually a good thing directed right. But when you turn it inwardly and you don't lift it upwardly, then you're trying to rein in the very thing that Jesus came into the world to help you with. You can't manage your emotions. If you got issues with temper and, and you, you, you got a short fuse, and you know what's amazing about the, the first passage of Scripture I read? Like, we're supposed to be a people that are so settled in who we are and in what we have and in the God that's with us that we're, we're good with our own emotions, and, and we now become concerned about the emotions for other people. Some of you have got issues with people that aren't here today. And God is going, did you listen to what that scripture said? You're supposed to be so settled in who you are in Jesus that you're good, your emotions, you're living in this communion with him, he's helping you. But you're so filled as you're communing with him, you're so filled with his love that you become concerned for other people that aren't in the house of God. And God is saying, if you would go to them like, I appreciate the worship, but would you just pack it up for a second and put it down and go make it right with the other person? Isn't that what Jesus did with us? Didn't Jesus come into this world to seek you out and to save you? Ultimately, all sin is just anger with God. Like, I'm not going to trust you. I'm going to do it my way. My way is better. I, wanna, I want what I want. You better go along with me, and if you don't, I'll have an attitude with you and not trust you. And Jesus goes, I know, but... Let me go into the world and let me begin to show you with pictures of love that you can trust me more than you can trust yourself. Do you know why I'm holding a microphone today preaching to you? Because I had a mother that lived out mercy. See, what we're talking about is mercy. What we're talking about is going after people because you're so settled in who you are and your relationship with God, and he's so given you and helps you mend the broken places, and you're, you're so good in trusting him for whatever that might mean that you're now able to focus on the world around you, and you become aggressive at going after them for the brokenness that life has brought them, and you want to help free them up and liberate them from their own issues of anger. Jesus came into the world and did that with you and I. He came into the world. He sought you out. He entered into your mess, and he covered over your sin in an active way. I'm standing holding the microphone today because I watched my mother. I would, I'd get mad because my dad didn't love me, but then my, my dad did some pretty, I, I think, infuriating things toward my mother, and I would be like, I'm going to knock his head off for her. And she would see it, and she would go, boy, if you talk like that again, I'll put your teeth down your throat. But no, I'm, I'm mad because I want to put his teeth down his throat because of what he's saying about you. Jesus is my defender. I don't need your help. He's a better, he's a better defender than you could ever be. But don't, see, you're going to lose your peace with all this anger that you're placing towards something that you're not trusting for. You need to learn how to trust Jesus with that. Yeah, yeah whatever. I didn't want to listen, but then it got me ate up in the inside. But then I would look at my mother and go, where does that kind of mercy and compassion and love come from because she trusted Jesus for her own mess and he so met her that she was so good that she didn't have to worry about herself anymore she became somebody that actively tried to reach out to people that even hurt her to try to bring them to a place where they would know Jesus for themselves I would just say to you this I think the world would be a much different place if Christians lived with that kind of aggressive mercy the world needs aggressive mercy it needs love it needs people who look on other people and see the brokenness and are so moved by the brokenness that they say, I have to live to do something about it. Not because that's natural to you, but because that's the life of Jesus inside of you. That's what Jesus does. And if you give place to him, he'll actively use your life to become an agent of reconciliation to an angry world, reconciling people to a God that loves them but is angry at their sin, and then there has to be something done to make the thing right. And that picture of mercy that will come from you and the Savior that you declare about the mercy that he's shown will become the hope that will turn their world around. You know, I look at culture and I think, man, this is getting dark. Look at New York. You can't go to the train. If I go to the train with my daughter, I was just in the city with her uh, 
in Manhattan, and I was, I was holding her, and we were standing in the center of the platform. I used to, like, walk up to the edge and try to look down at the rats that would run around and be like, oh, look at that, look how big that rat is. It's like a dog. <laughs> I don't go anywhere near the edge anymore because people are getting pushed right and left into the, in, into the train tracks. So I'm over with my daughter, and I'm holding her hand, and we're, you know, and she's watching those crazy people walking back and forth. Um, it's, it's, it's dark. And as we get closer to Jesus coming, it's only going to get darker. That's not negative. It's just a statement of fact. But here's, here's what I want to try to inspire you with. You got to get a hold of God for yourself. You got to bring your issues to Him. Whatever anger might be, you got to say, Jesus, here it is. I don't want to make this about me. I want to make this about you. Would you help me with this? I'm trusting you. Be the Lord of my emotions. So fill me with your love that it settles me for whatever this issue is with this person that's done wrong to me. But now, God, so fill me with your love that I'll go and I'll go to that person and I'll become some agent of mercy to them. Because when somebody comes after another person, when that person knows that they shouldn't be shown that kind of love, it starts to soften them. Doesn't it say this in Romans in the third chapter that it's his loving kindness that brings us to a place of turning to repentance? Well, how do you think the people in your world are going to turn? How do I think the people in Bermuda are going to turn? How do I think the people in New York are going to turn? Why is the culture in America such a mess? I would say it's because the church isn't really loving the way that Jesus set the example. We claim to be in him, but are we really walking like him? I don't think the world would look like it does if, it, if we did. I don't think families would continue to be the mess that they are, where people who know something about that love, like my mother, would stand and say, no, here's my anger, God. How did my mother get into a situation where she had an affair? My dad neglected her for years, years, with all kinds of other women. And it was just a one-off, one time, boom, and then all of a sudden my mom gets herself in a really messed up situation. And instead of being angry about it, she turned to a Savior and said, I'm not making this about me. I'm making this about you. Would you help me? Do you know my dad came to faith? All of my siblings came to faith. A family that probably would have perished in religion. All know Jesus because somebody stood in mercy and said, I'm not going to make this about me. Jesus, this is about you. I'm done. Most important part of our, our time together is just ask you to close your eyes for a second. Maybe you're here today and you've got some issues with anger, stuff unresolved. I don't care if you're, you could be 75 years old sitting here and never really given over to Jesus things that have created anger in you from your childhood. I've, I've seen that happen. I've counseled thousands of people. It's unfortunate how people go through life as believers and never give over to Jesus the things that have hurt him the most, the things that create the most anger. But it doesn't have to be that serious. It can just be some circumstance you're facing right now. Anybody in here, by show of a hand, you're struggling with a little resentment, a little anger. You're struggling to trust Jesus for relationships that you have that are costing you peace, are costing you joy, are costing you love because you're not letting go of what they've done or who they are. And you're angry at them. And you're trying with your anger to try to manipulate them and to control them. You're not God. You can't even control yourself. Why would you try to waste emotional energy trying to control somebody else with your anger? But anybody need to trust God with anger in some form, big or small, in here? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand again. I just want to see. Okay, there's a few of you. I want to do this. This is family. Like we say with Jaden, hey, my brother, we're here for you. There, there's nothing shameful about needing comfort in a time of need like that, right? It's true for him, but what's true for you, you just raised your hand. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Follow your hand up. Stand up. You could say, I don't want to really stand up because that makes me feel people look at me. Who cares what people think? There's supposed to be family. We're supposed to stand here and encourage one another and love one another. If you're standing, I'm just going to ask you to do this. Could you just walk out from where you are? Come down here. I want to pray with you. I want to pray over you. I want to pray that God would help you to leave here different than you came in. 
That's why we have church. We don't just hear, come to church to sing some music and listen to uh, somebody speak. We come to meet a living God who in a living way wants to change our circumstances, wants to change our reality. As you're, as you're standing here, um, just consider for a second. The Bible says be angry and don't sin, right? So what are you angry about? In your own heart right now, in your own mind, just what are you holding on to? What's this thing that's got the best of you? Does everybody, does everybody have that? I just want to, want to make sure we're all tracking here. I want, just want to make sure. Just show hands. You guys came forward. You got that in your head right now? What's making you angry in this moment? Everybody? Okay, good. Now, the Bible says, what do you do with that? You got to lean into a Savior. And first of all, you got to thank Him right now. You got to thank Him that Jesus came into the world to deal with, because when you hold on to anger and you make it about you, it's sin. It actually separates you from God. You got to thank Jesus that He came into the world that you would know forgiveness for making this about you. Can you just take a second right now and, and acknowledge to a Savior, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that my anger doesn't define me. Forgive me. You got to repent. You got to actually say, I'm turning from my desire to want to control this. I'm turning. And now, Jesus, forgive me for what I've done. But now I'm, I'm trusting you. And as you're trusting him for that, I'm going to remind you of you're a believer here. And the spirit of God has taken up your heart as his home. And that brings hope to us. It's resurrection power. Whatever has made you angry, listen to me. It's not as great as the one who's in you. Greater is he that's in you than anything that's been put upon you, anything that you're trying to fight through, whatever an enemy's tried to do to provoke anger out of you. Greater is he that's with you than anything else. And he is your portion. He is your love. He came into your heart to settle it, to quiet your heart with his love, to settle your anger. His love can become greater to you than whatever has been put upon you. Will you take a second right now and just open up your heart and open up your mouth and say, Jesus, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you're helping me. Thank you that you're going to work in me now. Your love so that that anger is driven out. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear, but perfect love casts out anything that's not of God, including anger. God, may that perfect love, even as they're trusting you, may it come down right now. May it begin to settle like never before in their heart. I thank you for how you've helped. Maybe this is a process for some, how you've helped them overcome levels of anger. But God, get them to a place where they become proficient in bringing whatever is right to you or whatever that is, the anger is, bringing it to you, God, so that they can trust you about how to manage it. As you're thinking about and trusting God to, to begin to stir that up in you. I'm going to ask you to just give consideration to this. And this, depending upon your story, this might need you to sit down with Pastor Gary before you go and you, you talk to somebody that maybe has really hurt you. But think about who the person is because it's, it's going to be a person that you've got some issues of anger about. Just like God loves you, God loves them. And God wants to work through your life, even if it's just you pray for him. He wants to work through your life to begin to see mercy made real in this person's life. Because I tell you this, eternity is going to bring real separation. God and the people that God loves. He loves everyone. He loves the people that create anger in your heart. He loves them. And in eternity, I don't care how much you might hate them right now. You will not have any kind of rest knowing that you could have done something to try to encourage them because what awaits people that don't know Jesus goes beyond what I've got the time now to even speak about. Separation from God. 
It's real. God's saying, work with me. Best you can. And this might take a process. This might take time. God, give me grace that I might be able to begin to work toward bringing reconciliation with people in you that they might come to the house of God and would stand with me and worship Sunday in and Sunday out, knowing your love, celebrating it. Ask God to begin to help you to act in a kindness and patience with these people, to love them, show mercy over them. Fathers, I've just taken a second to try to apply your word to the hearts of my brothers and sisters, God, as they've opened their heart in response and trusted you for how I've tried to lead them through this. I'm asking you, God, now in the name of Jesus to meet them, to bring life to them, to settle them, to quiet their souls, to fill them with love, God, to help them live out of an overflow of that love. Rivers of living water would pour in them, God, and not have issues like anger and taking exception and judgment with others control them. God, that's a work of your spirit. It's nothing we can do, but we thank you that you're with us to do it. And we trust you for it. Even now, in Jesus' name. Now, before you leave here in the front, can I I just encourage you to do one thing? This is, I think this is going to be helpful to you. It's one thing to call on God, but we need one another. Can you just take a second with somebody down here and just say, hey, listen, you don't have to get into all the details. This is something I've got some anger toward. Would you just pray, God, helps me. Can, can we just take a second and do that? Can you pray over one another? You don't have to get into counseling, but just here's where I am. This is what I need help with, and let's pray. the rest of you if you would if you could stand up as they're praying down here I'm grateful that you don't have issues where anger's gotten the best of you but I am going to pray for you that God would so fill you with his love that you would become those agents of reconciliation that you go into a world that you go into Bermuda wherever God would take you into your families into your jobs and that you would become people so filled with the kind of compassionate mercy that Jesus is saying we're supposed to express that it begins to turn your world around it begins to turn your families around come on can we do this can we just do this I'm going to ask you right now if you're standing just raise your hands those people that are in their seats just raise our hands it's an expression of God I need you today it's it's not some weird thing the Bible says I wish people everywhere as they pray would lift holy hands it's a symbol God today we need you God this church needs you there's an island of people here that you love there is a a, a culture here that you want to see impacted by the kingdom of God the kingdom culture that comes from above you want to invest this world you wanted to turn it upside down you wanted to change people's lives you wanted to change families and God you have the ability you've empowered us to do that but God we need you we need you we need you we need you Jesus if we're not those people now it's because not because of our world it's because of our connection with you when we are right with you we walk like you We're people that want to go run hard and show mercy to a world that doesn't deserve it. Would you help this church to become that kind of an expression of your body that Bermuda, through this church, would see a living picture of the risen Savior? We need you to do that. We need you to do that, Jesus. God, the world needs you to do that. Whatever it's going to become in the end times, Lord, darkness is something as a church, as we stand in the light of your love and we receive it, it's something that can chase the darkness back. Whatever it might be in other places, Lord, let it be said here that the light that comes from above shines so brightly that it gives light to everyone around. Jesus, we thank you today for your love. 
we celebrate it. We worship you. We thank you. Can you thank him right now for the love that you've received? Come on, if you're sitting in your seats, as your hands are raised, can you thank him? Jesus, we thank you today. We love you today. We're grateful for the life that we've received. Thank you. We praise you for it. May that life become greater and greater in our lives. Command us, control us, fill us that we might be like you. Let's sing that with all of our heart before we leave. As an anthem, as we go into the streets, he's not going to fail us. He's going to fill us with his love, that we would be a people like him. together and thank God. He can't fail. He won't fail. He's going to help us as we trust Him. Well, Grace Point, it's been such a blessing to be with you. So good to be in the presence of God together. Be praying for you as we go back to Brooklyn. Please pray for Brooklyn. <laughs> we need all the prayers we can get. Have a great day. Love one another before you go. Good morning. We're now going to have online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church. And uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online, that God will use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks. Because as you supply for us, O oh God, we're able to give unto your kingdom. I pray, O oh God, that you'll bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you once again because you are God. Amen and amen.
Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence, and we look forward to what he's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point. <laughs>